welcome to The Hive Podcast, a show that helps inspire you to pursue your passions and ambitions. My name is Jared Spink and I'm your host. I'm a photographer, videographer, and entrepreneur. Join me as I sit down with other entrepreneurs and creators to learn more about their process, how they built communities around their brands, and the experiences they've had along the way. I hope that these conversations inspire you to pursue your goals. You're listening to The Hive Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to The Hive Podcast. It's a brand new year. It's 2022. And to start things off, we have a fantastic guest as always, but we're going to dive into drones. Everyone that knows me or has chatted with me on Instagram or Twitter, you know I love drones. So this week's guest is Eddie Nunez. What's up, Eddie? Hey, what's going on, Jared? Dude, thanks for coming on. So for everyone that that doesn't know Eddie, Eddie is uh, the co-host of Drone Brews with Ken on the original Dobo channel and just a drone lover. You've been flying drones for years. I was looking back at your YouTube channel and it looks like you've been posting stuff for about four, three to four years, you know, going back and there was drone stuff all the way at the beginning when I was looking, man. So you've been doing drones for, for quite a long time, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, drones is what got me into the creative space, like particular cameras and um, just overall in this niche, if you will. So if you went back, you saw some of my terrible, terrible flying from my early days. <laughs> We've all been there, man. We've all been there. Um, it was all new to a lot of us, you know, when we first when we first started. And it's it's kind of like. It's just a weird experience when you first fly a drone and you've never done it before. It looks it looks easy. It really does. It looks easy, especially with GPS drones. I mean, they've gotten a lot better than they were three or four years ago. Um, yeah. But there's still skill involved, right? There's still like you got to know how to use those sticks, man. Yeah, like I uh, like the camera you're right. You you like if you look at my earlier videos, I'm probably breaking everyone's neck just by <laughs> the, the panning, the aggressive panning. Yeah, I think that's it's every uh, beginner's mistake is just those like jerky ca- camera movements just because you just don't know any better. You don't know to like go very slow on the sticks and the wheel and like just slow. Yeah. Easy does it. Easy yeah. does it. So um, walk me through that. So everybody, this is Eddie. Eddie, hello. Hey. <laughs> Say hello to everybody. Um wow. Walk me through how you got into drones three or four years ago, because, um, you know, I'm trying to think three or four years ago, it wasn't the beginning of drones, but it was the beginning of their popularity, like before it started getting oversaturated. Yeah. Um, three to four years ago, you had the Phantom two or the Phantom three, right? That, that famous white drone. And then you also had the three DR solo was out there. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that drone. And that was actually my very first drone, not because um, anything special about it, only because I walked into a Best Buy, I remember, and they had it on clearance. Um, It was the drone, two extra batteries, a backpack, and a gimbal for your GoPro Hero 5 or 4, I believe, I forget, Um, all for like about 350 bucks. And that was my first purchase and my first uh, investment into the drone space, man, that's cheap. Oh my word. That, I mean, that's like, that's getting, uh, 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 the mini two combo from Costco cheap right there. Like that's yeah, that uh, super cheap and it didn't come and with a camera, right? It was, it was a GoPro. Yeah. You had to attach your, um, your GoPro to it. Oh yeah. And those, and those and, GoPros back then were just not I know. good. Yeah. <laughs> And then, you know, the other alternative was to buy the Phantom, I believe it was like the Phantom 3. And the Phantom 3 standard was starting at around $1,000. And since it was my first drone, I said, let me go cheaper. And and then that was like an ultimate kit, right? A backpack, an extra battery, a gimbal for your um, GoPro. I'm like, this is the way to go. And so man, four, four years ago, we're looking at... I mean, it's 2022 now when this episode's live. So 2000, was that 2018? 2018. Yeah, okay. 18. Where was the part 107 at that point? Cause I think, you know what? I, I took my part 107 in 2018. So it was already established. It was already going pretty, pretty strong. Did you immediately, uh, when you got into drones, get your part 107? When did that start, um, 
coming into play. And for those of you listening that aren't familiar with part 107, part 107 is the license you have to get from the FAA as a drone pilot if you want to do any sort of drone photography, drone videos, and make money doing it. Even if it's exchanged for goods, even if you're just trading good, you're supposed to get your part 107. So um, did you do that right off the bat or was that did that come later on? No, not at all. I mean, I, you know, typical consumer, I bought this drone and I started flying. I didn't even know that the FAA has some sort of oversight into drones. Um, you or know, that I, you have to register your drone for $5. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, none of that. None of that. I, I, I registered my drone when the Mavic Pro came out because that was okay. my next upgrade. So once I got the Mavic Pro, I started becoming more involved as well with the local drone community community here in New York. And that's when I started learning like, hey, there is regulation. There is an FAA. You do have to register your drone. Um, but all that time prior, I mean, I, I, I had no idea as a consumer. I wasn't so involved, you know. So what was the first drone after that? Was the you said, Matt, the Phantom 2 is the one you got or, or is it the three? No, the. I, the, my first drone was the uh, 3DR Solo. Oh, and then 3DR after Solo. That, yeah. Then after that, my next upgrade was the Mavic Pro. The Mavic Pro. So how different was that from your first drone when you first when you first got it? Was it just like a night and day difference to you? Oh, uh, yeah. Totally night and day difference. I mean, just the, um, the portability of the Mavic Pro, right? Um, it's so small and compact. You can fold it into your bag. And then the transmission system was a a game changer because the 3dr solo was a wi-fi based drone and i can only go up you know to a certain point especially living in new york where we have so much radio interference it's kind of like the spark is too now right it's all just wi-fi horrible don't get guys do not get a wi-fi drone spend a little extra money and get something that does not like communicate through (laughs) wi-fi Yeah, it's not worth it nowadays. I don't even think there's any Wi-Fi drones besides the Amazon toy grade drones okay. out there. I mean, the Mavic Mini is coming with OcuSync, which is crazy. Um, but that was a total game changer. Just the ability to to go further um, from you and just the signal strength back to your radio and the portability overall was a game changer. Yeah, I mean, your drone's only as good as it can communicate to the controller. Like, there's a couple of things that make a good drone, and the camera is not one of them. Like, a camera's in, it's up there, right? You want to get a good image, but you can, drone stuff is cool to begin with. So, like, you can sacrifice a little bit of quality. I mean, nowadays, not really, because <laughs> everything's so good, so it all looks good. But back then, you could sacrifice a little quality, but if you couldn't have a good transmission and you didn't have good battery life, like what well, it's yeah. no good. It's no good. Yeah, so exactly. what was it about drones that got you hooked and into the creative space? Like when you got your drone, like what, what was it that just got you got those creative juices rolling? Well, I started traveling more. I started going to new, you know, new destinations, whether besides like family vacations, right. Where you want to capture those memories like even locally, like traveling to different parts of New York, uh, visiting the surrounding states and all those scenic locations. And I started to capture it with my drone. I said, I want to start sharing this, um, this footage. Cause for me, I thought it was like, you know, it's, it's, it was impressive. It was eye opening, just the ability to capture certain things from an aerial perspective where you're not using a helicopter. Um, you know, that, that to me was, uh, uh, an immersive experience that I wanted to start sharing. So that's what really opened the doors to YouTube, um, where I started sharing my content. And then that also opened the doors for me into the creative space as well, um, where I got my first camera. So where are you at now in your creative journey? Let's fast forward three, four years and talk about where you're at now in the, in the drone community. Um, are you doing, are you doing work with, with your drones? So I think, to answer your question, then we'll get to the meat of your question. Yeah. Where am I now? I am a, a gear and drone hoarder, <laughs> right? <laughs> All of us, man. So All much, of us. Yeah. I have so much crap. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do. So, you know, for me, drones and, and, and cameras and stuff is more of a passion hobby first. And then it's a, a side hustle second. Okay. So I do. Yeah, I do. I, I, I have it. I don't I don't advertise that I do any um, commercial work, 
but I have done several commercial work that I've done through referrals, friends and family, um, and all that money that I earn from any commercial work goes right into a pot either to buy more gear or family vacations. That's strictly what I do with that kind of money. Yeah, that's awesome. And then, and for you guys listening or watching, if you're hearing my, um, my alerts go off from, from getting emails through, through Apple. I don't know what's up. I, I, I put do not disturb on and they're still coming through. So sorry about the, the dings. If you, if they're actually coming through on the recording and you're hearing them, I hope not, but I, I guess, I guess we'll see. Um, well, that's cool. I think that that's how a lot of people start off is it's a side hustle. And that's how I started off too. I, I mean, I had a full-time job, um, and I got into the creative space and loved it and then wanted to start to make money doing creative things. So I could buy, I could, I could hoard more gear and buy more gear. <laughs> um, and, and that's where getting the part one seven came into play and being able to charge, um, for, for doing drone work. Uh, what kind of drone work, what kind of drone work are you doing on the side occasionally? So what I've been specializing in is, um, the commercial, um, the commercial aspect of New York city. So like restaurants, businesses, yeah coffee shops, lounges, um, some nightlife, you know, um, bars that you can visit that's outdoors here in the summer. So I've been specializing in that area um, in terms of making overall videos. And then I use a drone to incorporate, you know, the the aerial aspect of that location that I'm trying to showcase. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes perfect sense. And there's a, it's still so unique, even though it's, it is very saturated, it's still so unique that businesses want to be able to invest in that and get just a different perspective of their business and what they do. And I mean, that's only one aspect of many, many avenues you can go down, uh, with a drone. Uh, let's transition a little bit because as you've grown, um, as a drone pilot and you've gotten more involved in the drone community, you are now the co-host of drone brews with Ken. Uh, Ken's a great guy. He's been on the show as well as his past co-host, Paul, uh, Paul's off doing his own thing with Kyle Watts. Also, I mean, all these guys have been guests on the show, Kyle and Paul are doing the, uh, alpha shot, which is kind of like a, a Sony focused, um, live stream. And now you're the co-host of drone brews. How did you meet Ken and did, and how did you get involved in, in drone brews? So I met Ken, I want to say about two to three years ago, um, at a New York city, uh, drone meetup. So we, we had a meetup where we, um, you know, we're gathering around certain key locations, landmarks around New York city, and we were going to film it. And uh, Ken was actually up here, up north, visiting Billy Kyle. And uh, I I was friends with Billy Kyle for, you know, as soon as I started getting into the drone space, because I, I leveraged his YouTube channel to kind of learn more about drones. Um, and, you know, we quickly just started networking and we became good friends. So when Ken came up here, that was also the same uh, weekend that we were hosting these meetups. When we were going to different parts of New Jersey and New York, just capturing aerial views of the city. And, uh, you know, me and Ken just, uh, networked then and there and, and we kicked it off. Right. And then, um, you know, Ken started to invest more and more time into, into the YouTube space and become more of a, you know, creator, um, less as a hobbyist or less for fun and passion, if you will. And, um, I just followed his journey and we've been, we've been great friends ever since he's helped me so much in my process and my journey as well with tips, advice, um, you know, always providing constructive feedback as well, so I can get better. And, uh, you know, whenever Ken is such a great guy that whenever I needed something and he had an extra of whether it was a drone battery because uh, Mavic Pro, I only had one and he knows that I wanted more time and he had extra. He was able to ship me that, um, you know, without even me asking just because he wanted to help. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, he, he is such a supportive, supportive guy. There's no way I would have got the Mavic three when I did, if it wasn't, it wasn't for him. So, um, if he's listening, thank you. And then also you mentioned, you mentioned Billy Kyle, who's also been on the show. This is great. Everybody's been on the show. Um, yeah, big I, shout yeah. out to to Billy. Um, we're recording this. I mean, it's when you're listening to it, it's it's 2022. We're in. It's the new year. Um, but it's currently actually December 21st for <laughs> for Eddie and I. And That's Billy, free there. Bi- yeah, Billy was a big shout out to Billy because he got interviewed on Bloomberg <laughs> about yeah. drones. Like that's huge. Dude, yeah. If you're listening, yeah. by, uh, Billy, you made it. That if people ask when do you know you made it, 
you made it when you got interviewed on Bloomberg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's great. As well. I, you know, he reached a hundred K subscribers like a month or two ago. So that's also a big accomplishment. That's huge. That's huge. So shout out to Billy if he's, if he's listening. Um, so you got involved uh, in drone brews. How, how, how do you like live streaming, man? How is that being a co-host um, on a weekly live stream about, about, about drones? It's um, it's fun. I mean, it's a full time job. I didn't realize um the amount of effort that goes into a live stream, a ton. um, because you're having a conversation with, you know, your other host. In this case, it's Ken, and then you have to monitor the chat and also interact with your participants in the chat and making sure that you're giving them the intention while sticking through to your agenda, right? Because every live stream has some sort of topic, and and we have an agenda that we build behind the scenes of certain key points that we want to hit um and we want to you know be uh considerate of that one hour as well we don't want to go off on a tangent so it's hard just to manage your time uh interact with uh each other and then interact with the live chat as well so if anybody yeah it's it's a lot of fun going live it's a lot of fun it's it's a it's its own beast (laughs) for sure Uh, especially managing the chat um what for anybody that wants to do a live stream and let's say they want to, you know, have, you know, co-host two people, uh, what kind of duties are you doing as, as a co-host? Um, so scheduling the live streams, coming up with topics, looking for guests that I can help, uh, can bring onto the channel. So proactively emailing people that, that you find online in the creative space as well, that may be relevant to the topic that we're speaking upon. Um, looking online right so interacting with people online finding out what are some some trends in the drone space since drone brews is so focused on drones right looking at the drone news drone articles um the forums right like the mavic 3 is something right now that's a big uh hot item as well as the autel nano drone so just digging throughout the week and finding clips that i can share with ken so we can prepare for our live stream that's great. So you, uh, there is something I wanted to ask you before we dive into the next topic I wanted to talk about, because we're going to talk about the Mavic 3, because I think at this point um, in, in 2022, first week of January, anybody that was going to get the Mavic 3 initially right off the bat um, should have it by now, or it's coming very, very soon, um, at least this month. And we're going to talk about the Mavic, but I had a question about being a drone pilot in New York real quick, because um, I've been watching a, a few of your videos. Uh, so I'm here in Southern California and San Diego, and there are restrictions. You know, we have a lot of military here, a lot of military bases. So you got to be careful and you got to, there's certain areas that are no fly zones and certain areas you, you have to get a waiver. Um, very important because um, the military test stuff and you don't want your, your drone just falling out of the air because they're testing yeah. technology. Um, how is it flying in New York? Because I know it's got to be way stricter because I, I mean, there's a ton of coastline here and that's kind of uncontrolled airspace and there's, you don't even need, you know, you don't have to get, get a waiver or anything. You can just go fly. But I know by the city, it is crazy strict and you have like areas that are like drone parks too, right? Where like, it's a designated place to f- yeah. fly drones. Kind of walk me through some of the restrictions that you guys have to put up with there in New York. Yeah, it's, it's pretty unique. Um, you know, I think the, the the hardest thing that we have going for us is that we're surrounded by three major airports. We have JFK, we have LaGuardia, and then we have Newark International. Um, all within, you know, they, they have that five mile radius. So they kind of all kind of overshadow one another when you look at the map. Um, but the good thing is that we do have also portions of New York City that's that falls under the uncontrolled airspace category. Um, and you can f- fly freely there. Um, the best thing that happened in New York City is that they, you know, Lank uh, came in and and they added Lank to LaGuardia. So, you know, oftentimes when I go out or when I know I'm going to go out to fly, I go ahead and request a Lank approval ahead of time. Or even I, when I'm out in the field, when I, you know, didn't have anything scheduled per se, um, it's very easy. It's fast to do. You go right on the app, right? There's several apps that you can use and you can request that authorization. Um, you know, they har- the most difficult part for us is two things I want to say. One is that we know we all know that airspace is governed by the FA, right? So the FA will give you that clearance, let's say through the land approval. However, New York City has this very, very old, outdated ordinance law, which states that you cannot take off or land any aircraft within the five boroughs of New York City 
unless it's at a heliport or an airport. And unfortunately, drones are considered an aircraft under this ordinance law. So, you know, that being said, you may have the approval from the FAA through Lang to fly in open airspace. But if you have any sort of interaction with local law enforcement, such as NYPD, they may give you a hard time because of that local ordinance. And we've seen guys here that have gotten, they've, none of them have ever gotten arrested. However, they've gotten their drone taken away and confiscated. And they've given a court appearance ticket um, to show up at court and, and go through a hearing. Fortunately, once this case gets in front of a judge, they look at it and they just throw it away and they get their property back. It's never been through a trial. In fact, you know, last year during the height of COVID, we had a, um, and don't quote me on this, it was either a Wall Street jur journalist or a New York Times journalist, one of those, one of them two, he went and flew his drone. He was F, he was part 107 um, uh, licensed and he flew his drone over to a little portion of uh, New York City called Hart Island. And that's where they were burying bodies, unclaimed bodies that, you know, people that passed away during yeah, yeah. COVID. Um, and unfortunately, he got a lot of heat for that. And um, while he was flying, NYPD did confiscate him, uh, confiscate his drone, I mean. And, uh, you know, he had to go to court as well um, for that. And fortunately, I think fortunately for everybody in this space, you know, his case was also thrown out, which, you know, it's kind of a, a, a bogus um, law to have. I think it was signed in the early 60s. So like the millionaires and the rich and the affluent couldn't have private heliports on top of their buildings here in Manhattan. So that was the purpose of that. But they've been using that to kind of like single out, you know, drone operators as drones are getting more and more popular. So that's something that you have to worry about that you may have to have an interaction with law enforcement. That's one downside. The other downside is if you're flying DJI, almost everywhere in New York City, you have a ceiling cap of 300 or 400 feet, right? Depending on the location that you're at. And we can't clear buildings because all our buildings are most, you know, way over 400 feet. So you just have to be cognizant of where you're flying um, because if you lose signal, you know, that's not a good day for you because you're not no. going to, your drone is not going to clear it. Um, and you may not get the shot that you're looking for because you just, your, your drone physically won't be able to fly higher than 400 feet. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. It's, it's, I find it fascinating all the different laws and everything that different drone pilots are having to deal with, uh, across the country. And I mean, there's a reason, there's a reason the FAA, uh, governs airspace and it's, it's because we don't want, different counties and different states having multiple different laws. And when you cross over this imaginary line in the air that all of a sudden everything changes. So it's, it's governed by the FAA. It's one flat rule across the board, across all U S airspace, but we yeah. are dealing with very interesting laws that cities are trying to do. Um, and I think, I mean, some cities have tried to try to put laws into place that are technically illegal because um, cities don't govern airspace. The FAA does, but they are implementing laws that, hey, you can't take off or land in, you know, in our city or in our county. So you have to deal with that. Um, you know, there's there's laws that here locally that certain uh, beach cities are trying to implement that you can't fly a drone over the beach. Well, I mean, they can't say that because they don't govern the airspace, but they can say that you can't take off and land on the beach, <laughs> you know? And yeah. so you can, uh, you can only be so far from your drone to keep it in sight. So um, it's, it's getting interesting. Um, hopefully it gets figured out over the next couple of years. And I know there are um, a lot of um, people, especially there, there's a handful of lawyers that really have, have our backs and, and are fighting for us to make sure that we have the rights that we can to, to be able to operate and fly. And um, I don't mind it getting harder as long as the laws are clear exactly what we need to do, because sometimes it can be very jumbled and very, very confusing on exactly what we need to do. Yeah. Um, let's transition though. Let's okay. trans let's, let's talk about something fun. Cause I don't want to get into the whole, the, the legal aspects and, cause we're not professionals. Right. And it's, it's different right. all over the place, but um, yeah. going back to the Mavic three. So everybody should have it that originally ordered it. Hopefully, hopefully um, or it's coming very soon. Let's talk about your experience with the Mavic 3 because I have it, you have it, um, you have the Cine version, I have the regular version. So let's kind of compare notes. What are your initial thoughts um, of the Mavic 3 when it was released? Did you think they made some pretty good leaps forward from from the Mavic 2? I I certainly think so. Um, you know, it's no secret the Mavic 3 was released 
um, without being, you know, fully up to date with all its features and capabilities. However, um, just flying it initially, I saw the difference immediately in terms of its flight characteristics, its signal strengths. You know, one of the things that I battle here in New York is just all the radio interference. So, you know, when a man drone manufacturer claims that you can go, let's just say five miles out in New York City, really that for me, that's probably half. That's like two and a half miles. So I did notice a tremendous difference in signal strength and quality with the uh, Mavic 3 and um, the camera. I mean, the camera in itself is just eye opening because, you know, you can take you can almost have the same image that an Inspire has just because of that micro four thirds sensor. So that to me is a total game changer. You know, for me, our city looks the most beautiful at night. And um, that's when you want to leverage a camera such as a micro four thirds camera. Yeah, that camera is amazing at low light. I mean, I hated pushing anything above ISO 200 on the Mavic 2. Like definitely not above 400 and 400 was was super grainy. I, I've flown this thing at night at 3200. Looks great. 6400 is a little grainy, but you run a, a, a noise reduction on some video editing software. Whew, it looks yeah. looks fantastic. Yeah battery life just oh yeah oh it's so great i'm i'm easily getting an extra 15 minutes compare easily an extra 15 minutes compared to the mavic 2 um like you said that camera it's just crystal clear like it it's you look at it and you compare it to the mavic 2 and it it is a completely different image uh, yeah so there are some great things about it but i agree it, it, it was released unfinished and it's still is an unfinished product even when we're recording this um and mm. probably when you're listening to it too they just released not too long ago the the software update that they promised in late january it came a month early in december i think they i think they rushed it because they wanted it to be better for anybody that was getting it during the holidays um because it's there but it's still not there we're missing some features we're missing uh quick shots which is whatever like that's not a big deal to me um we got point of interest um and and Hyperlapse. spotlight and active track those were important to me those are, are features i needed um but you can't shoot you can't use them in log you can't shoot in log um luckily the image out of the mavic 3 straight out with that house of black color uh, i posted this on twitter yesterday just a screen capture of a straight out of camera image from a from a video i was working on for a client and it looks great a very just, awesome. yeah, you adjust the, you know, the midtones a little bit and I add a little saturation, just a little bit. It's a great looking image. So it's not a, not the end of the world that you can't shoot log in active track. You just probably shouldn't shoot anything in log if you're going to use that feature so you can match it super, super easy. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and the Mavic three does have some opportunities in my books. Um, you know, one of the things that I generally miss is um, the log preview, the the um, log preview, right? Yeah, so it's missing. I, yeah. So the first time I went and shot the um, the Mavic Three in in uh, in the, in a flat color profile, I overexposed by one stop. So when I got home and I tried to bring that back to a Rec 709, I had the most difficult time, and I was getting some sort of color shifting and tint shift because of, of, of how flat that was. Yeah. So LUT, uh, you can't have a LUT preview and it, that can be difficult because the log in the Mavic three is way different than the log in the Mavic two. It's, it's much, much flatter, uh, which isn't bad. That's actually really good because it's more of a blank canvas. It's more, you can push and pull that image a lot more when it's flatter and do a lot more tweaking and get it very unique depending on, on your needs. Uh, but not being able to have a preview of just a basic Rec 709 let can be pretty difficult. You just need to know based on based on your editing style how much you need to overexpose. Um, you had a hard time with a stop. I usually have to go about a stop to a stop and a half just based on uh, some of the brighter ed edits I do for for real estate. Um, but overall, my experience with it is it's it's a great drone. A lot of people were complaining, but um, I like it. I think my biggest hiccup with with it um was getting used to the fly app i was so used to yeah. the go for and it's all i've ever known is the go for app so to, to go over to, to the fly app which is um more simplified and more basic 
um, it was difficult. You brought out a good yeah. point though, but uh, it's easier to set, adjust your camera settings um, in the Fly app, but you got to dig to change a lot of stuff. Yeah, the Fly app is not as bad as I thought it would be. Um, however, I just don't agree of, for DJI to have the Mavic 3 running on the Fly app when the when the Fly app was originally introduced for a Mavic Mini. There should be some sort of separation there. You're calling this your prosumer drone. Well, then give us a prosumer application for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I understand where they're coming from, right? They want to get everything on one on one app, right? Like it's just it's it's got to be way more work to have multiple apps for different drones. Like let's have one app. But that app should change based on the drone you're flying, I think. Like if it can connect and sense that like, okay, I'm getting ready to fly the Mavic 3 and not a, you know, a mini or whatever, like it should unlock or open different features than any other drone and make it a little easier and <laughs> better better to fly cuz that to me the Mavic 3 out of the box does need some tweaking because I think switching over to cine mode which used to be tripod mode if you're used to the Mavic 2 um, switching over to cine mode just kind of slows everything down it's too slow it's it's too slow that needs to be sped up and the normal is too fast so that needs to be slowed down it, i mean that's just my opinion that's my opinion yeah. Yeah, um yeah. have you experienced when you're trying to land the drone that it's it's crazy jerky when you're trying to get close and, and land it. I've noticed with mine and, and maybe it's just mine. I've, I've heard drone supremacy kind of mention this, that when you're, when you're trying to land it and you're trying to just do minor little tweaks to get it where you need the thing, just like I try to push right a little bit and it just go, it just jerks like crazy. Have you had that? No, I'm not. I'm not seeing that in mine. Um, and by the way, just disclaimer, you might hear church bells behind me is because it's, <laughs> It's six o'clock in New York City, and I have a church at the corner of my street, and it plays a song at twelve and six. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but no, you know what's interesting is that everyone is seeing different issues. I don't have that jerkiness. However, I can't hand catch the uh, Mavic Three because of the um, the uh, obstacle avoidance. It, it pushes back, right? I'm used to hand catching my Mavic, my Mavic Two. This one I haven't figured out yet, and I don't want to make that mistake where I go grab it, I hit the propeller, next thing you know, it goes flying out my hand. Yeah. And there goes, there goes my drone. Uh, but the issue that I am having on mine, and I'm seeing it more and more online, is that it's disconnecting from my my controller. Like literally, it can be it can be sitting on the ground in front of me, and it says aircraft disconnected, and I have to reboot it. Huh, that's strange. Yeah. Everybody's having yeah. different issues. Hopefully, they fix them. Um, I've had a few issues, nothing too major. Like today, I was um doing a hyperlapse at a client job, construction job. So I'd do a quick hyperlapse. And I noticed that after a few minutes, it would just, the app would just close out. The drone was still connected. It was still doing the hyperlapse, but I'd look down at my controller and the app wasn't open anymore. I didn't do anything. <laughs> so I, I had to open it up. I, I haven't had the horizon issue like some people have had, at least not that I've noticed. What I have noticed, which was pretty crazy, is... I think I was in cine mode and I was, um, I was flying backwards, just kind of pulling away. And as I was pulling, I wasn't, I was only using one stick. I was pulling away, but as I was pulling, it was gaining elevation too. Like oh, wow. slowly, but surely gaining elevation. And it wasn't windy. It wasn't crazy. So that was kind of weird. I'm like, why, why is it going up? I'm not trying to gain altitude. I'm not even using that stick. What's going on here. <laughs> so that's been a little crazy. Um, how are you liking ProRes? Are do you see a difference between ProRes and not shooting ProRes? No, not at all, actually. Um, you know, if I had to go back and repurchase the Mavic 3, I wouldn't I wouldn't buy the Cine version. Um, the only reason why I went for Cine was because I wanted the RC, mm -hmm. the RC the smart controller. Um, and I didn't want to buy it separately because then I'm I'm only a few hundred dollars shy of getting with you know, getting the Cine. Yeah, so like I 700 think, bucks difference, right? Yeah, if I'm going to spend four grand um, on a drone, let me just spend the whole five and get the complete bundle, the, you know, the top of the line, how DJI um, calls it. But uh, absolutely no difference in H.264, H.265 compared to ProRes. Um, you know, my computer loves it better because it's an easier codec to, you know, kind of go through and transcode. However, 
you know, I'm going through storage storage space like crazy. I usually archive all my flights. And if I'm shooting in ProRes, I'm only archiving like something exclusive that I really love. And I'm cutting in and out. I'm not keeping the whole entire flight um, because the data is just insane. In fact, um, you know, I went and shot the Brooklyn Bridge at night and I shot all that in ProRes. And that was about just 20 minutes uh, overall collectively um, with all my clips. And that was about 640 gigs. Ooh. Worth of footage. Yeah, Ooh. 640 gigs. Yeah, because I had I mean, I used the um, Samsung T5s, one terabyte drives to edit on. And I had another project there when I started transferring over, you know, I just clicked and drag, and it said I have no space. I'm like, what do you mean I have no space? And I looked, how much space do I have? I had like 480 gigs left. And then I'm like, wait, 480 gigs. How much is this? How much is this, this footage? And I looked at the at the Mavic uh, a folder, and it was like 600 and something. I'm like, wow, wow. Hey, so can you? Do you have to shoot D log to shoot ProRes, or can you shoot standard color pic, uh, picture with ProRes? You can do standard. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Have you tested out the new update with the supposed noise, the added noise reduction with ProRes? Were you able to test that out? Uh, I did this weekend actually, and um, I have not noticed. I don't notice a difference. Okay. I mean, I have not noticed the difference at all. I mean, it's such a great camera to begin with. It's such a great camera. So as, as much as Eddie and I are complaining about some of the faults to the drone, because it's an unfinished product, um, I think who maybe, maybe it was Ken that mentioned it. Like as much as we all complain, it's a better product at release yeah. than any other drone company releases. So even though it's an unfinished product and we're all griping because we spent a ton of money on something that wasn't fully finished, it still at release was way better than what everybody else is releasing. <laughs> yeah, hands down, I mean, hands down. The problem with technology, Jared, is that we're spoiled. I mean, we want GoPros to shoot 5K, 120 frames a second. We want the DJI Action Camera too to do the same. We want log and everything. You know, we're just we're just spoiled as a consumer at this point. Absolutely spoiled, rotten. For sure, because technology has gotten so good, there's no excuses, no excuses yeah. anymore yeah. for the manufacturers and for us to be able to create something that looks that looks good. Well, Eddie, man, th this has been great. Totally like nerding out on drones uh, for anybody that wants to learn more about drones or just follow your journey and check out everything you're doing with drones because you've done some great stuff. I love the video you did shooting the, Bro the Brooklyn Bridge it was absolutely amazing. Very unique. You don't see that very often. Um, where can people find you and follow along on your creative journey? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. It's Mr. Eddie Nunez and also YouTube, same Mr. Eddie Nunez. Awesome. That'll all be linked down below in the show notes, the description of the video. Eddie, thanks for coming on the show, man. Thank you, Jared. Thank you for having me. Of course. Of course. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this very first episode of the Hive Podcast for 2022. We're coming up on two years of the podcast. So thank you for your support. Thanks for listening each and every week. And if you are listening in Spotify, Spotify has a brand new feature. You can now leave a five-star rating and a review of the podcast um, as long as you've listened to at least 30 seconds. So they're actual legitimate, hopefully legitimate reviews from, from listeners. So if you're listening in Spotify, I'd appreciate it if you leave a review. Otherwise, hey, just thanks for listening. And I will talk to you guys next week.